Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of Allah, the Most Benevolent, the Most Merciful. Um, I think I'll just go right into it. Um, the topic for tonight is uh, it's actually a very it's a topic that somebody had um, wanted to be spoken about, and it's a very interesting topic. It's a very important topic, and it's an important topic because it involves a lot. Ultimately, because the topic involves Allah. And the title of the topic is Towards an Authentic Connection with God How Islam Goes Beyond Religion. And so, to begin, we have to reevaluate this term religion. And so, what do we think about when we talk about religion or think about religion? We think about um, a particular set of beliefs. And a particular uh, format of worship, perhaps a particular way of dressing, and and things like that. So we have you say you say the Christian religion. You have a particular picture in your head what a, what, a, what the Christian religion is like. You say the Jewish religion. You have a particular picture of what the Jewish religion what that is like. You say the Islamic religion. You have a particular picture of what that uh, what that is. And this picture is something that is actually quite limiting. And often we get trapped in the picture. And this is not a new observation. People tend to, to say this statement. People tend to say, say this statement all the time. And people tend to think of it as a, as a modern issue. But when we look at the lives of all of the prophets and all of the messengers of God, we see that the same situation was there. Let's look at the New Testament, for example. The New Testament says that Jesus, says, Do you sneeze at a net and you have to swallow a camel? I'm sure we've heard this before. Do you sneeze at a net and swallow a camel? Meaning, when trapped in religion, the search for loopholes ended up creating even greater distances from God. So, a camel and a gnat, both of these things are haram in the Jewish tradition. They're not, they're not, you're not allowed to consume them if you're a follower of the Jewish tradition. And before you go back to that, let me say that one of the uh, Bible translators translates this statement is, Do you strain out the gnat? You know, a strainer, do you strain out the gnat? Meaning they, had to, they worked hard. To avoid the small haram, they worked hard to avoid the small haram, but had no problem with the big haram. So, prophets do not come to become founders of religions. They come to revitalize the souls and to revitalize the communities that they preach to. Thus, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to his prophet, the final prophet, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says to the Prophet, Ya ayyuhan nabiyyu, inna asawunnaka shahidan, wa mashiran, wa nadhiran, wa da'ira ila Allahi bi'ithni. He says, O Prophet, indeed we have sent you to be a witness, a bringer of good news, a warner and a, a person who calls to Allah by the permission of Allah. But despite this ayah or a similar ayat, what happens? Religions end up becoming founded. But if I even go back to the Bible, there's nowhere in the Bible that says that Moses السلام, founded the, you know, a religion called Judaism. And nowhere in the Bible does it say that Jesus founded السلام, nowhere in the Bible does it say that he founded a religion called Christianity. And with all of the other faith traditions, the same situ situation exists. 
all this, all the, all the, no matter what the particular faith tradition you come across, with maybe maybe a couple of exceptions, the people that are said to have founded these religions, they themselves never said that their religion is, you know, this title or that title, because the titles were formed or formulated later on. And so this Quran comes along. It's sent to the final messenger or to the final prophet of Allah. May peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. And what does the Quran say? It says, in the deen عند الله الإسلام that the deen and the presence of Allah is Al-Islam. That's what the Quran says. And it says that the followers of this path are called Muslims. Who was Samakul Muslimina min fi hadha. That God named you as Muslims, not just in the Quranic revelation, but before the revelation came. And so Allah named this path Islam, which as we know means submission to God. Allah names this path Islam. And the people who, pra who practice this path or who follow this path, Allah named those people Muslims. Thus, we don't call ourselves Muhammadans. We don't call ourselves Muhammadans. If anyone says Muhammadan, then this person is making a mistake. We don't call ourselves Muhammadans. So just by the fact that we call ourselves as Muslims, we should already see ourselves as upon something special. And upon something unique. And it's true that when we talk to each other or we talk to other people that we may use terms like religion. Or we use terms like Sunni. Or we use terms like Shia. However, Islam is something which is beyond religion. It is something which is actually beyond what people may think of it. And you know that God is the same way. The Quran teaches us, it says, and they have not reckoned God correctly. They have not reckoned God properly. They haven't, they haven't uh, conceived or considered God properly. They don't have a proper measure of God. They see Him, meaning they see that 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 God is presented in 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 term in very small terms, whereas the reality is God is is um, bigger terms. Among the attributes of Allah is the attribute of His knowledge. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's the all-knowing. The seer on the walls, Al-Alim, He's the all-knowing. He is the all-aware. And Allah understands that people are at different levels and that people will always be at different levels. Some people will be engineers and some people will be carpenters. Some people will follow one particular career path and others will follow another particular career path. Some will follow one, edu one educational path and others will not follow the same path. So just as there's diversity in the physical world when it, when it comes to, let's say, finances and education and all that, the spiritual world works in a similar way. Not everybody is meant to be a scholar. Not everybody is meant to be other things. Yet, the Islam of Allah, the Islam that was sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, has something for everybody at all levels, no matter what level they are in. Well, what's the evidence for that? Well, for one thing, 
all Muslims, no matter his education level or his or his uh, his or her um, financial level or education, all Muslims are obligated to say five daily prayers, right? All Muslims are obligated to say five, five daily prayers. And so if a Muslim is in a state of tahara, then they should pray. And so the prayers that all Muslims do, whether they're literate or illiterate, what prayer does is it maintains a minimum contact with God. So all Muslims are to maintain a certain level of connecting with the with Allah the Almighty, and this is why the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, says he supported us said, "As-salatu imaduti." That prayer is the main pillar of this of this deen. This is the Prophet's statement, and he also says that on the day of resurrection what's the first thing that that people be questioned about on the day of resurrection first thing prayer. is prayer that's what the messenger of Allah وسلم, said the first thing to be questioned about that God questions about on the day of resurrection is prayer and Allah also says or Allah says that prayer Restrains a person or a people from immorality and from shameful action. This is what Allah says. Meaning that prayer it functions as a moral check. And so you go to the societies, like even today you go to the Muslim societies. You know, even acknowledging all of the various political and economic and social problems, you go to the Muslim societies, you still see healthy family units by and large in the Muslim societies. You still see strong morality when it comes to sexual issues. You still see sobriety and honesty and discipline. You still see these type of characteristics in a very strong way in the Muslim societies. <laughs> because the prayer is pricking at their conscience. Now, what if a person wants to go beyond that? And this is getting to the core of what uh, we have been asked to talk about. What if a person wants to go beyond this? What if his or her heart is not satisfied with with uh, all that other people are doing, with all that other Muslims are doing? You know, is it okay to feel dissatisfied in the first place? And it's a, it's a reasonable question. And to answer this, let us use an analogy. The analogy of education and work. There are people who have the minimum that society offers to them. And they're okay with that. They're happy with that. And that's not an insult. That's not a, that's not a put down. I mean, there are people who are happy with with you know, minimum. Maybe they're not materialistic. They're not they don't want the stress that is associated with other issues. So they're happy with whatever minimum they're able to get. Because there are people who are happy just to have a roof over their heads. And so in the in the spiritual world, obviously according to this dean, one is, are, is obligated to offer the minimum of five, five daily prayers. So there's, there's a minimum. There's a minimum is, is a minimum religiously, just as there's a minimum in the physical world. You know, the, the, peop, the, the basic minimum that people want is food, clothing, and shelter. And so a person wants to go beyond that. If they want to go beyond that, that's perfectly okay. 
That's perfectly commendable. And most people encourage their children to go beyond what just food, clothing, shelter. Most people encourage their children to do that. You know, to pursue their dreams, to pursue their career dreams, to pursue their educational dreams. To well, people do that. They encourage their children to do that. So to go beyond that is certainly commendable. And indeed, we all have unique needs and unique um, uh, ambitions. And, you know, not everybody would be interested in those uh, those, those same issues or those, or those same topics or those same ambitions. So, spiritually, to go beyond, to have a stronger connection with God, if we're going to this question to, about going beyond, to go beyond, to have a stronger connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we have to begin with strengthening what we already do. Thus, we have not only this. Thus, we have the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. The Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ has beautiful examples of going beyond. So, so yes, we pray the five daily prayers. These are fard. These are these are obligation. These are prayers that we're obligated religiously to do. But we also have what uh, people popularly call sunnah prayers, right? Sunnah prayers. So he prayed, he offered prayers more than the five daily prayers. And again, these prayers are usually called sunnah. And, you know, people, a lot of people, they say sunnahs. They go, like, oh, I'm, I'm going to pray to sunnahs. People say that. We're going to pray to sunnahs or pray for sunnahs. People say that. The Hadith literature provides a comprehensive list of those prayers that Rasulullah would offer in addition to the obligatory prayers. And yes, there are some differences here and there among uh, the, the scholars of this tradition as to um, certain numbers of rakahs and, and um, is this particular uh, uh, text valid? Is this particular text valid? There's, yeah, those things exist. But for the most part, there is uniform agreement about what the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would do in his voluntary prayers. There's, there is there's uniform agreement into the, the format that he would do. So, for example, there are, in the Fajr prayer, there are how many rakah? Two rakahs. But what are, are there any, there's, but there's also two rakahs before that. What do we call it sunnah? If you want to pray a sunnah, you can pray two rakahs before Fajr. And at, and these are the very hard ones, you know, for those who also work. At Zuhr time, in Asr time, you know, Zuhr has four rakahs, and Asr has four rakahs, as obligatory prayers. But you have narrations that say two rakahs or four rakah before Zohr, or two and four after Zohr, right? About the Asr, there is some dispute. But you even have a narration that, that uh, you actually have three narrations that say, that associate uh, uh, prayers before the Asr, two or four rakahs before the Asr, two rakahs after Maghrib. And of course, the rakahs before and after the Aisha. So we begin. If we want to have an authentic or stronger connection with Allah, then we have to begin by increasing the observance of Salah. But again, most of us work. I mean, even in Muslim societies, it might be hard to pray more than the, than the Fadr prayer. But can you, in a non Muslim society, it is extreme. If you want to, just to get the five daily prayers in, it's very hard. And, and some people, a lot of people, what they do, they just wait till their evening, which is not a good thing either. They just wait, you know, till they get off work and just say all five daily prayers at once. They, you know, in row, they spend maybe 30, 40 minutes offering the, all, the, all the prayers at one time. 
So yeah, so most of us work. So, and you still want to get close to Allah, so what do you do? Well, I know this answer may seem like bid'ah or something, but I'm used to those types of uh, statements, doesn't bother me anymore. Why not pray the sunnah prayers on your day off? When you're not in such a rush, on your day off, in addition to the, to the far prayers, to the obligatory prayers, pray those voluntary prayers on your, on your day off when you're not in such a rush. And that means you have to plan for it. Just as you plan to go to the movies, you plan to go to the grocery store, you plan to pay your bills, you plan to do this, you plan to do that. Maybe make a plan for on Thursday or Saturday or Sunday, whatever day you have off to pray, to pray extra, offer extra prayers. Similarly, we are obligated to fast in the month of Ramadan. Of course, there are exceptions, um, people who are ill and pregnant and so on and so forth, but you know, we're obligated to fast in the month of Ramadan. But you can also fast outside of Ramadan. The Prophet's practice in والسلام, and his practice is actually is, is very moderate. He wasn't an extremist. The Prophet's practice was to fast twice a week. Mondays and Thursdays. Very moderate. Fast twice a week. And when we pray, what most of us do is we, rec we recite the Fatiha because the Fatiha is necessary. And we recite short surahs, right? Al Ikhlas. Every, how many people know Al Ikhlas? Everybody knows Al Ikhlas. Sure. How many people know Al Kawthar? I'm sure everybody here knows Al Kawthar. And 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 Nas and Al Falak. You know, these are the very short surahs. This is what we do. When we pray, we, we recite the Fatiha and we recite the short surahs because this is what we have memorized. At minimum, this is what we have memorized. So every Muslim may know three or four surahs. Every practicing Muslim, excuse me. Every practicing Muslim may know three or four surahs. Well, the Quran is Allah's guidance, Allah's scripture, Allah's revelation to man. And if you want to have a stronger connection with Allah or a more authentic connection with Allah, then you have to read more Quran and you have to recite more Quran. You have to memorize more Quran. That's what you have to do. And I would suggest using what you memorize in prayer, particularly the prayers that in which we say the Qira'a, we say it out loud, like the Maghrib prayer and the Aisha prayer. Here comes uh, another answer to this particular subject. You know, in the, in the centuries, Following the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the final prophet of God of Allah, in the centuries or so, perhaps not even one hundred years, Islam spread, and the Muslims who followed the Prophet were not just a a, a band of people worshiping; they now became an empire. They now became people. Who, who were creating, or you can argue, who created civil, uh, not just a civilization, but civilizations in the plural. And when those things were happening, several trends emerged. Several, uh, I'll use the term religious, several religious trends emerged. And what's important for tonight's discussion is that one trend emerged as a response to the same sort of issues. Because earlier I quoted what the Bible says that Jesus is alayhi salam. 
So the type of issues that he faced, the Muslims as empire or as civilization, Muslims face similar issues. And the trend that emerged was a trend that sought to strengthen the spirituality of, of the Muslims. And today this trend is called, usually by the term Sufism. And sometimes people uh, just refer to it, to the trend of Tazkiyot al-Nafs, which is the name of this ongoing program. Or the term Tasawwuf, the people of Tasawwuf. And I don't really want to uh, to, to uh, divert the flow of this conversation by going into all of the details associated with those things. Perhaps in the, in the, in the, in the Q&A, maybe if you, if you really want, we can go into those details. But I don't really want to distract us from the, about what, by mentioning those details. But from this trend of, of, of Sufism or Tasawwuf, from this trend, Many sorts of ideas emerge, and many sorts of figures emerge. Some very great scholars and very insightful and spiritual men and spiritual women emerged, but also some bad figures and some bad ideas and some bad practices. But you know what? The same can be said of Sunnism and the Shiaism and the Salafism and any of the other trends that have emerged in the Muslim community that you have you have um, um, good in them as well as bad in them the same can be said of any of the other trends that have emerged from the Muslim community but remember what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said هُوَ سَمَّاكُمْ سَمَّاكُمْ مِنْ قَبْلُ فِي هَذَا Allah said that He named you Muslims he didn't name you Sunni or Shiri or Wahhabi or Salafi or whatever. He, Allah says He named you Muslims. And He says that that, that, that deen of Islam, that that is the deen acceptable to Him. فَلَا يُقْبَلْ مِنْهُ Allah says the deen of Islam is that which is acceptable to Him and that, that, that any other thing is not acceptable to Him. And that such people who pursue a path other than the path of submission to God, that such people at the end of the day will be among those who are losers. So Allah didn't say Sunni, Sunni or Shi'i or Salafi or the other one. No. Allah said Muslim. Allah said Islam. And Allah, He sent this Qur'an and He sent the Prophet peace and blessings of Allah be upon him He sent the Prophet as the final Prophet to function as His messenger to all humanity And from this messenger, from the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, from this messenger, we have a complete guide in terms of going, in terms of both minimum worship as well as going beyond that. So if a Muslim wants to just say his five-day prayers, okay, he can just say his five-day prayers. But if he wants to go beyond that, you have precedence from the Sunnah. هُوَ الَّذِي بَعَثَ ثَلُّمِينَ رَسُولًا مِنْهُمْ يَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتِهِ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُزَكِّيهِمْ وَيُعَلَّمُهُمْ كِتَابُ الْحِكْمَةِ وَإِنْ كَانَ مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ So, looking to increase your connection to Allah. You know, you can go, and this is what people do, you can go and get a sheikh, uh, an imam, uh, a murshid, you know, you can go, you know, in some kind of call it peer or peer sahib. You can go and find somebody to to follow. You can do that. And and, and make bay'ah to such a person. And make this say this person is your spiritual guide. He is your religious guide. And follow his advice on 
what surahs to recite and how many times to say this dhikr, how many times to say that dhikr. You know, you can do that. But the core of what that person tells you needs to be based upon the Qur'an and upon the Prophet's practices as universally understood. And Allah says, وَمَن يَقِيِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدَ فَازَ and فَوْزٍ عَظِيمًا That those who give their obedience to God and His Messenger achieve a mighty achievement indeed. And so obedience to Allah and obedience to His Messenger generates success, it generates blessing, it generates mercy. By being firmly grounded in the Qur'an, and in the Prophet's spiritual practices as universally recognized, meaning by which there is really no doubt, you will be able to recognize Baltu, meaning you'll be able to recognize when something is off, and to be able to shake it off, just as the way you shake off dirt from your clothes. The Prophet وسلم, said something very, very interesting. And this hadith is a hadith which hopefully most of us know. If we don't know the hadith, then perhaps we should take time to memorize the hadith. And I think that most of us know this hadith because it's in a little small booklet called 40 Hadith. Most of us, I think, own this little small booklet, 40 Hadith. From the recollection of Imam Nawawi, rahimahullah ta'ala. And in this hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, وَالْإِثْنُ مَا حَاكَ فِي نَفْسِي وَتُرَدَّدَ فِي صَدْرِي وَإِنْ أَفْتَاكَ النَّاسُ وَأَفْتُوكَ You know, he's defining for us what sin is. You know, what is that? You know, what's sin? Prophet says that sin is that which turns around repeatedly in your chest. Even though people have told you, they've given you their fatwa, that is okay. That is not a big deal. You know. That's the Prophet's definition. That you know something is off. Even if if people are presenting you empirical evidence to the contrary or so-called empirical evidence to the contrary, you know something is off. You know something is not right. So, apply this. Even when you, even in terms of what you may think of as a snack. So, if you think something is fishy, if you smell the fish, you know fish, you leave it out for a while, it starts to you know, smell badly. If something smells fishy, that your advisor or your sheikh or whatever that you're reading and following, if something doesn't seem right, well, and if you have the opportunity to ask this murshid or whoever, then to ask that person, where is the evidence for, you know, Quran says, قُلْ حَاتُ بُرْحَرَكُمْ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِكِينَ Ask this person, where is your evidence for this idea or this belief or this practice? Where is your evidence in the Quran? Where is your evidence in the Sunnah? Or even ask this person, you know, to, if not the Quran and the Sunnah, at least to provide something rational, at least to provide something that that would that would make some kind of sense, even if you don't agree with it, but at least you under, understand why it was it would. Uh, be said or done and always be a people who are willing to study who will, who are willing to go back to the book of Allah and so that be, that means to be a repeated reader of the book of Allah and so this is an advice because in the name of many things but particularly in the name of, 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 of Sufism or Tasawwuf or Tasqiyat and Nafs or in the name of many other uh, religious movements that have emerged 
or uh, trends or ideas that have emerged. We give this advice because you find in all these trends, you find a host of beliefs and a host of practices that actually can be spiritually, spiritually dangerous. It's like you take poison, you're thinking that it's medicine. Well, it is in fact poison. And if, if interested, perhaps we can give some examples in, in the Q&A. But more than um, talking about spiritual movements, I would say that this advice that I'm giving is also advice on whatever you read or whatever you study from, from Muslim speakers or Muslim philosophers or Muslim teachers as well as non-Muslim speakers, non-Muslim philosophers. Because, you know, there are people who go to college and, you know, maybe about the, the second year, they get introduced to uh, Western philosophers. And then they start to question everything. They start to question everything. You know, they, they get impressed with the terminologies and the, the, the so-called insights of, of these philosophers. And even if they don't end up giving up Islam, then the, their Islam becomes corrupted. And the corruption.